it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you all to our Women Who Lead event to mark International Women's Day. What promises to be a fascinating discussion is aimed at celebrating the inspiring stories of political and community engagement centered on the lives of remarkable women and their incredible achievements. It is a time when we all get together, virtually at least, to honor the essential contribution of women to public life. We are going to showcase their exceptionally hard work and indeed their successes so as to set up an example for the next generation who are striving to do good in the world as well and to become leaders. My name is Nabila Ramdani. I'm a journalist from a French Algerian background who is currently based in London. I am particularly interested in the experiences of groups who have traditionally struggled to make themselves heard in the world. And so an event like this is the kind that I really relish. And I would straight away like to thank the European Partnership for Democracy and its members who have organized this discussion as part of the contribution they make day in, day out to a more equitable and indeed inclusive society. There is no doubt that the EPD stands for values that are at the very heart of democracy, human rights, good governance and universal participation. The other organizations I'd like to thank for supporting this event and indeed these values are Demo Finland, the Danish Institute for Parties and Democracy, the Netherlands Institute for Multi-Party Democracy, the Netherlands Helsinki Committee, People in Need in the Czech Republic, ALDA, the European Association for Local Democracy, the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, and the club, the Madrid. I've worked with women's groups all over the world, from the United States and Europe to Africa and the Middle East. And I'm always intrigued at how issues are the same, no matter where you are in the world. And I'm certain that we'll find an awful lot of common ground during our discussion today. And in this respect, it is absolutely heartwarming that we have an audience of hundreds connecting from all parts of the world, including Europe, Latin America, Asia, and all points in between. Beyond bonding in our discussion, we are particularly focusing on the lives of our four brave women who are all innovate, innovators and we'll be honoring them as part of our celebration of International Women's Day. We will hear about their careers, how they became change makers, how they overcame political and societal barriers, and how their activism enables the next generation of women across the globe to follow in their footsteps. I have covered the plight of ethnic and religious minorities in my own work. And this has included the violence that these groups often experience, often from the authorities. I've witnessed terrible events in numerous countries and there is often subjugation, discrimination and the kind of patriarchy that is prevalent in so-called advanced Western societies and developing countries. Brutality against minority groups because of their skin color, the gender and sexual orientation or religion is shocking wherever it happens. And the reason why all of us should be striving to do something to stop it. And this is why it is so important to hear from our panelists today. It is crucial to highlight their campaigning, actions and struggle to bring about change. We need to hear about their successes too. So let me now say a few words about our four outstanding speakers, ones who are taking action with passion and dignity to try to affect the lives of minority groups for the better. 
from black ethnic groups in the UK through trans and LGBT communities in Europe and South America and to young girls and women facing patriarchal challenges in Nepal. Our speakers are Iman Eitan, the actress, activist, and leading voice in the Black Lives Matters Matter UK protests and founder of the Black Reformist Movement. Tamara Adrian, the Venezuelan lawyer and academic, and the first trans woman to win a seat as a member of the Venezuelan Congress. We also have Sidita Zaya, who is executive director of the NGO Pro-LGBT and someone who is fighting for the rights of the LGBTI community in Albania. And Krishala Jisink Tameng, one of the youngest elected vice chair people of the Doramba rural municipality in Nepal. And just as impressively, Krishala is also a national level martial arts expert. Unfortunately, Sophie Hessen, a politician for the Dutch Labour Party, is no longer able to join us today due to poor health. We of course wish her uh, well and the very best of luck in her endeavors. Our speakers will tell us about their specific work and achievements as women leaders, while also widening the discussion to talk about the importance of women's leadership in society as a whole. Other general themes we will be discussing are how our speakers successfully overcame obstacles in their careers and what exactly motivates our speakers to keep going in their chosen fields and indeed striving to get things done. What I am certain about is that the speakers will get us thinking positively about how we can make a difference in the world ourselves. I will start off the discussion with each speaker who will be talking for five minutes each, and I will then open up the conversation for 25 minutes to half an hour to the audience who can use the Q&A functionality to put their questions across. The chat function will also be available throughout our webinar, so we welcome your constructive comments and opinions too. And please do also feel free to use the hashtag women's wave for this event online to tag, post and quote from our discussion. Now, let's hear from Iman first, since you're a Londoner, just like myself. In the wake of the alleged murder of George Floyd uh, by police officers in the US, the whole issue of police brutality especially against black people, came to the fore again, not only in America, but globally. So Iman, we would love to hear how you felt compelled to take action about here in the United Kingdom and how you became not only an impromptu organizer in the Black Lives Matters movement, but soon enough, you became an iconic leader in the protests. We would also be fascinated to hear how you ended up founding your own reformist movement to tackle institutional racism in everyday life and how it differs from the Black Lives Matter movement. There have also been celebrities involved, such as Madonna. So please do tell us all about that, Iman. We would love to hear you. Thank you very much. Um, first and foremost, I'm very happy to be here. So that's the first thing that I have to get off my chest. Um, so just to give you a bit more of an insight as to who I am, um, I wanted to do two things in my life. I wanted to be an actress because I watched two films, The Green Mile and Forrest Gump. And the feelings that I felt watching those films just took over me. And I remember thinking, wow, to be someone that watches 
something can to feel so inspired by actors I think that's such a beautiful feeling so that's why I wanted to be an actress to be able to inspire empathy and feelings in people and then the second thing I wanted to do was I wanted to help people that was the main aim so I thought I have a characteristic of wanting to spread light and wanting to help and make a difference in the world and I knew that it would be a shame to lose that. So whatever I did in my journey, I would have to end with trying to help or make some type of difference. Um, and so what happened is I ended up focusing all of my time and my energy becoming an actress, because as we do as human beings, we want to strive for being alive and happy and finding love and success and all the things that we want as human beings and what the universe or what society tells us we need to be fulfilled. So I chased that. So I went off the acting, me, myself, and I, those three things that I had in common with myself, me, myself, and I, let me sort out my life, let me get inspired, let me be empowered, and at that point, I can then help people. At that point, when I've sorted out my own life, fulfilled my own dreams, at that point, I can help others. So that was the plan. And so I went to a very prestigious acting school and I left that school and for 10 years I aspired to be an actress so I could eventually inspire people to be the best versions of themselves and for 10 years I struggled for 10 years I felt lost depressed unsure of where I was going in life what my purpose was if I would ever find happiness and I sat in that loneliness and I sat in that pain of wanting happiness for a very long time almost 10 years and everything about my life was very much focused on just two things become something and then you can inspire others to become something. That was the journey. I didn't know how I was going to fulfill those two things, but those are the only two things that I wanted to do in my life. And for 10 years, I never got anywhere. Never got anywhere. I felt depressed, felt lonely, felt sad, felt like a failure. And then we fast forward to the end of May, 2020. And I'm in my room. And someone sends me a video of a black man being murdered by a police officer. And for the first time, it was like I was able to just step out of my bubble and just focus on something else, something bigger than these stupid aspirations that I've given myself, something bigger than my life. And watching him be murdered spun my life around. And so whatever journey I thought I was supposed to go on ended that moment when I watched that man be murdered. And I remember thinking, how are we at a point in 2020 we are, when we are watching a black man being murdered by a white police officer? How are we here? 2020, how are we here? How are we watching this right now? How is this possible? And I had to sit and I had to really work out what was going on, where, where are we in the world? And that's when you stop and forget all the stuff that's happening with you and you think about the world and you think about the people in it. And for many years, I thought I was that person that did that, but I wasn't. It was only that moment that made me transition from me, me, me to yes, we, we. That was where I began my journey in that moment. And so watching that video changed my life. I felt depressed. I felt lonely. And my mum told me to take a walk. So I was like, all right, mum whatever <laughs> I'll take a walk in lockdown why not let's take a walk so I thought right I need to multitask I don't want to just take a walk aimlessly let me go out and get some toothpaste so I went out to get toothpaste 
and I'm walking down the high street and I see a huge group of people walking towards me and they're chanting black lives matter black lives matter black lives matter and I just it was the only thing that I needed to hear in that moment the only thing and so instinctively I jumped over roadworks all athletic in that moment don't know how that happened jumped over roadworks and I joined that protest and it was the people that I met that day that told me to go to another big protest in Trafalgar Square where there would be thousands of people go and attend go go and see what it's like so I went and I got there and the energy was kind of in my opinion not very energetic so I stood on a pillar and I looked for leaders to see where the organizers were in the in the thousands of people that were, were there at this protest and everyone that's there decides to look back at me as I'm stood on this pillar and then a random lady comes up to me she taps me on my shoulder and she says here you go here's a megaphone so I went out that day to get toothpaste I went to get toothpaste I was sad about George Floyd I went to get toothpaste and that day someone random someone on their own journey intertwined with mine and said here you go here's a megaphone and in that moment, I remember standing on that pillar, stood in front of thousands of people in the middle of Trafalgar Square, and I said, this is ridiculous. I can't use a megaphone, this is ridiculous. I'm not an organizer, I'm not a leader, I'm just some random black girl from Beckham. <laughs> I can't use a megaphone in front of thousands of people, this is mad. And then the second thought was, use the megaphone. Use it express your pain, express how you feel, stand up for what you believe in, use it. And so I went with the latter and I decided to go with my instinct and I decided to vocalize and express how I felt in that moment. And God only knows why this happened, but a beautiful sequence of events happened after that moment. I expressed my pain, expressed how I felt about racism, specifically to do with reform and specifically to do with institutionalized racism. And then a beautiful sequence of events happened. I ended up the next day leading my first ever protest. I then found myself doing speeches along star, alongside the movie star, John Boyega, which again, I'll probably die wondering how that ended up happening. He walks through the crowd, makes his way towards me as I'm speaking and stands beside me. The next minute, you know, we have BBC. Hello. Every news news outlet that we can think of, it was insane. So I went from being an average girl who went out to get toothpaste, who believed in something and who wanted to vocalize how she felt, to then standing next to John Boyega on a random day. I then went from standing next to him to then organizing my first official protest which had 20,000 people in attendance at Parliament Square in London during the BLM protests. I was fortunate enough to meet Madonna and lead Madonna and her family on a march that day. And of course, naturally, that made everything explode even more so because it's Madonna. So I found myself everywhere from Hong Kong to New Zealand to Turkey to Italy and this all happened due to the fact that I decided in that moment I was going to stand up for what I believed in, irrespective of my circumstances, irrespective of how I felt about myself in that moment, irrespective of where I was. I knew that I believed in something and I only had one choice, which is to stand for it. And so that's what I did. And I found it to be a very hard journey it that way so as much as it was magical and it was inspirational and truly surreal it was very difficult I believe in reform and I believe in combating institutionalized racism which is a form of racism that isn't really talked about in fact it's ignored and I think that's the biggest reason why we don't make progress as black people 
because society doesn't want to accept that within organizations there is a culture of prejudice which stops the directors from being black, which stops the highest manager from being black, which stops the senior executives from being black. This comes from an actual place of racism, whether people want to realize it or not, it comes from racial bias. It comes from unconscious racial prejudice. It is fueled by stereotyping. All of these things are what add to institutionalized racism. The same thing we witnessed with George Floyd, where a police officer was able to kneel on a black man's neck in a uniform, mm. that is called institutionalized racism. That is when a whole institution allows something because they are prejudiced. We don't like to talk about that in the globe. It doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in America, whether you're in Italy, whether you're in France, whether you're in England, we don't like to talk about that. And that is why we don't make progress. And so long story short, I ended up finding myself writing for British GQ. I found myself in British Vogue in the September activism issue. I found myself doing a documentary for BBC London. And that day I went out to get toothpaste. And I found myself boarding an organization called the Black Reformist Movement. BLM UK stood for abolition. It stood for communism, ending capitalism. That's not what I believed in. I believed in focusing on the thing that got George Floyd killed. And that was systemic racism known in the US, also known in the UK as institutional racism. That is what I was focused on. And so that is what I focused on. And that is how I built the Black Reformist Movement, an organization that is solely focused on combating institutionalized racism and also empowering black communities. And so our aim is to collaboratively work with organizations throughout the UK to ensure that they implement strategies, policies, and procedures that help to ultimately create an anti-racist culture. And that is what we need to be moving towards as a society. Not talking about diversity and inclusion like we have been doing for decades. Now mm -hmm. let's talk about the real things that affect society. And that's why I'm here, because I followed my instinct, because I stood up for what I believed in, irrespective of how people felt. And because I know what is true and I know what affects us as black people. And Thank you very much indeed, Iman, for speaking so candidly, so passionately, and indeed so movingly. And I can assure you that there's nothing average about you at all. <laughs> <laughs> the fight for justice and equality for black people is certainly gathering momentum and so are you. And this is very encouraging indeed. Let's hear from our second um, distinguished uh, speaker uh, today. It's Tamara Adrian. Tamara, your background is firmly anchored in the legal profession as a practicing lawyer, as a law professor, and indeed as a lawmaker. And I noted that you have a doctorate and indeed another postgraduate diploma in law from my home city of, of Paris. I've already mentioned that you're the first transgender person elected to office in Venezuela, but you are also the only second transgender member of a national legislature in the Western Hemisphere. You are a relentless campaigner against homophobia and transphobia and for trans equality um, globally. It would be hugely interesting to hear about your personal motivations and your professional career in this respect, but also about your legal uh, victories and indeed the challenges that still lay ahead. Uh, in a recent interview, for example, you said that Ven Venezuela has gone backwards on LGBTQ plus rights, uh, for example, especially compared with other countries in the region. So please talk us through all this, uh, Tamara, if you please. Oh, thank you very much, Nabila, for your question and uh, um, for the opportunity of being here with the uh, DIPD uh, webinar. Uh, I, I will start by saying that uh, I uh, started to feel discrimination uh, when I started to transition uh, into a woman back in the 90s. 
and uh, uh, that nowadays, and that's uh, not a secret that I've been saying that uh, uh, all around the world, I am much more discriminated because I am a woman than because I am a trans person uh, in general. Uh, let's say that a few persons know that I'm a trans person. Most of the of the people just see me as a woman, and uh, they are these various and sometimes subtle and much of the time very aggressive forms of discrimination against women uh, that I didn't feel before. So um, I had this unique position in a way in which I started to late in my life to, um, to feel discrimination against women. And uh, this is, I say, a unique position because uh, women are trained, are uh, trained basically by via education uh, but since very early to behave uh, according to gender stereotypes. And uh, uh, when I realized that I found my driving force, I felt that it was uh, my, my task, my commitment, not only to achieve equality for LGBTI people that we have been unable to do under the dictatorship we face in Venezuela since 1998. But also, and perhaps um, much more important, uh, to act on, on behalf of every discriminated and um, every um, non uh, uh, group with no equal rights. Uh, I've been working for more than 20 years, both at the national level, at the international level, at the international level with the UN, with the OAS, and with uh, several treaty bodies. Uh, and um, uh, doing so, I uh, was able to participate in what I mean, the change of the world. I often ask people, how many people do you know that are actually in the core of changing the world? And uh, I think uh, for me, that uh, has become a patient. Uh, it has become a motive of uh, living and um, a way in order to realize uh, myself as a human being. And being a lawyer, being a law professor, being a doctor in law helps actually in order to have a discourse, in order to have a proposal, in order to make uh, proposed changes and um, make advocacy. It helps uh, because most of the changes you're asking for in the first time or for the first uh, part of this uh, fight are legal changes. But I, as I often say, legal equality is the first step in order to achieve uh, the um, equality in the facts. Equality in the facts is not possible without a law granting those rights. But the sole fact that the law established the rights is not the guarantee of equal rights uh, in facts. And this is the case uh, in most of the world for, for women. Uh, in the paper nowadays, um, women have the same rights than men, but in fact, uh, they are not having, receiving, getting, obtaining uh, the same rights in the facts. And um, um, this is how I, I had been involved with the CSW, with uh, um, the uh, UN, 
um, the World Health Organization, and and so many other organisms in order to make proposals to um, create incidences. And in the case of Venezuela, my passion is also uh, mixed by the fact that uh, we lost democracy in, in my country and uh, we don't have any more free and equal elections. In the last, uh, the last one we got in somehow was the one I was elected in 2015. But since then, uh, all the political parties were co-opted by the regime via using the judiciary system that they control. Um, they have appointed as head of those parties that were democratic parties, people that are uh, in favor of the dictatorship. And uh, they have uh, been changing the rules uh, for, for the elections. And now uh, what we have, it's a non-democratic regime uh, that uh, have caused so many, uh, uh, so many um, harms to our population. And now 5.6 million uh, Venezuelans are spread around the world and are considered to be refugees according to the UN. And now, uh, since, uh, as, since very early, I started to warn about the totalitarian pretensions of the regime. I, was, uh, I started to write and talk about this back in, two, in 2011, 98. Um, I, I was in this position in which uh, I had the political analysis, but I didn't have the platform in order to uh, to create a change. Well, and this is how uh, yeah, I switched. Tamara, because uh, I think yes. the topic of uh, the rule of law and certainly equality before the law are uh, things that we are going to develop during our, our, our Q&A. Uh, uh, certainly, this is at the heart of, of, of equal rights. And um, it does remain a, a challenge, as you said, to protect all communities before the law. And But you are highlighting just why it is essential to persevere. I would like to bring in our third speaker now, uh, Sidita Zaya from Albania. Sidita, you are campaigning for the empowerment of the LGBTI community in your country. And I think it's, um, it's fair to say that um, Albania is not very much talked about in this respect in the media. So I have a whole host of um, questions for you. First of all, what's the situation like for the LGBTI uh, community in Albania? And how did you become um, outspoken about these issues? And more practically, what kind of concrete actions is your organization pro-LGBT taking to improve uh, the situation for such communities? Thank you so much, Nabila. Uh, I wanna start by thanking everyone who shared uh, from the heart the stories. And um, I kind of feel Mm, honored to to be also sharing a piece of uh, of my heart in this uh, in this um, webinar we're having. So, as uh, Nabila already said, in Albania, it's not very much talked, just because maybe compared to the rest of Europe, we're still behind, <laughs> as in many many other things, but especially to LGBTI issues. Um, it's been my 12th year as an activist, as, as a, a community leader, working on these issues. And uh, as the other speaker said, I think it, it started only uh, from a will to change things, to help people. And uh, because honestly, I don't like injustices. So uh, my inspiration to, to, to become part of this um, movement I think came from my mom. 
it's uh, maybe too much cliche, but I've seen this woman like day in and day out, waking me up, feeding me, uh, taking care of me, never forgetting a birthday, never forgetting anything, working jobs. And I know that you will say that men do that too. I know they do, but I'm talking about my mom and she's my inspiration. And I think uh, that woman did so much without ever being seen. Sorry, it's never a Zoom webinar if there's no cat in it. I apologize. Um, that is Turba, by the way. And um, so uh, back to what I was saying is that um, never been seen. This woman and uh, many women in my life, um, as you and me, <laughs> we work every day and we never get the recognition. I mean, uh, let's forget our activism and the things we do outside, but even inside, it's, um, I don't think that's fair. And actually my activism became from being maybe mad. Uh, something like Imam was saying before, just to connect maybe the feeling of anger and uh, not, uh, not having fairness in these societies, we all are trying to create and all are trying to improve. So um, I think the LGBT movement in Albania, it's a bit connected to the uh, women movement because honestly, in my 10 years of work, they have been uh, the only women that have trusted in us when we wanted to start protests and change things. They have been the only helping hand. And uh, they've been women trust uh, putting trust in us and us giving it back. So uh, I might say that like, rather than saying we don't have a law on uh, gender recognition, we don't have a law on cohabitation, there is a law on anti-discrimination that is very um, like general. It's a good one, but it's still general and it's not being implied. Rather than saying that, I really would like to take this uh, opportunity here to more talk about um, to take this time to reflect why, why, why we do everything, or at least me, why, why do I do everything? Why do I go every day at work? Because in our day-to-day -day tasks and emails and everything, you sort of lose the bigger picture and you become very, you know, uh, robotic in a way, but then pandemic happened and everything happened. And I think except for the factor that I said, my mom is a big influence and all the women I know, I think an exterior um, motive for what I do is that in these uh, 12 years or more of my experience, uh, the younger generation are starting to, to, to show that they have, uh, they have adopted or they, they know more, they are fearless, they, they come out more as LGBT persons, they are stronger, they, they break morals more. Um, and I think when we have the possibility like in protest or when we do activities, we did the Pride Online last year just because we wanted to be close to our community. In a pandemic, LGBT people, I think, suffered the most. They usually suffer <laughs> enough without the pandemic, the isolation and everything that comes with being closeted and being uh, dependable financially. The pandemic added that and we really want it as an as a, um, organization, but also as um, community leaders. We wanted to show the LGBT community that we care, that we're not going to be stopped and that especially in days when uh, everybody feels uh, isolated, for the pride we were there for them. Mm -hmm. And the feedback that we got from the youth is, is priceless because they, um, they are the ones that I looked uh, up to for, for new ideas, for new inspiration every day. Um, yeah. I think I lost a bit my train of thought. <laughs> you gave us a very clear uh, picture okay. of the kind of grassroots activism that you're involved in. And I'm sure there will be follow-up questions. I certainly will have follow-up questions for Perfect. you in you know, the Q&A sessions. I would like to finally uh, go to all the way to Nepal uh, to hear from uh, Krishala Jisingh Tamang, a young elected uh, politician. 
uh, in Nepal, the issues of women's rights are often set aside in developing societies. And the idea being that once the country reaches a certain level of development, only then we can turn to women's rights, which are not considered a priority, but very much like an afterthought instead. But clearly, Krishala is having none of that. And you are working to raise awareness about the very real challenges faced by young girls and young and women in a Nepalese society, such as education, forced marriages, and indeed even human trafficking. So I think we would truly be interested uh, to hear what motivated you to get involved in politics and hear about the kind of activism you're involved, uh, you're involved in, in general. Uh, if you could um, uh, paint a picture for us, Krishala. Okay, so I think Krishala is having some technical problems to connect with us. So um, let's uh, carry on our conversation um, and wait uh, uh, until she uh, can uh, uh, join us um, later on in this, in, in this conversation. I uh, certainly would like to start off uh, the discussion and, and and basically, uh, if I can, uh, as um, in my privileged status as a moderator of this conversation, I would like to pick up on a, a couple of things that uh, Tamara has highlighted and indeed um, uh, bring in Siddhita in the conversations as well. Uh, Tamara, you said during your, your presentation that legal uh, equality is the first step before achieving equality in fact. Now, I noticed that uh, Siddhita uh, also has a human rights background and she's very much involved in grassroots uh, activism. Uh, a part of her uh, activism also involves putting issues uh, in the media on the agenda out there. So Tamara, I would like to ask you and Siddhita uh, come back after that. Do you not think that changing perceptions within society is just as important as legislating and that legislation cannot be the be all and end all. Let me know your view. Yes, basically that's what I say. I mean, uh, the law, it's a tool. Without the law or a public policy, uh, you cannot achieve equality in the, in the, um, in the field of, uh, of legal matters. But uh, the uh, legal equality is not enough. Uh, let's take into account, for instance, the right, uh, uh, women's rights. Uh, women didn't have a right to vote when uh, this movement for uh, um, suffragist uh, movement started uh, very early in the, in the 20th century. Uh, there was only one country in the world that had uh, uh, voting rights for women. And uh, it took a hundred, a hundred years, or more than a hundred years, to achieve equality in the law. But th that, those that means that um, uh, in politics, women have equal rights, uh, equal opportunities, and um, uh, the same um, the same probabilities of being elected. No, that's the other change that you have to um, to uh, create, which is a social change. The societal change, it's indispensable, but without the law, it is not feasible. Yes, Sidita, could you uh, please also uh, comment on that? And I have to say, this echoes uh, one of the questions we've received by Amruta Krishman, who also made that um, a comment. Uh, so feel free to address that, Sidita. Um, so legal changes in Albania have happened, except for the two that I mentioned earlier, but uh, for example, our problem is mostly, mostly with implementation. Uh, since we try to get into the EU, governments pass laws that are not willing to implement. And in this case, it's very important to have a law, but if it's not working, then in the end, <laughs> it's not so important. Uh, so our strategy has been working with uh, media and we all, uh, at my uh, pro LGBT has a media portal that we try to raise awareness on LGBTI issues and we train journalists to have um, 
let's say, an ethical reporting of the LGBTI perspective, because uh, for the journalists in Albania, it's a sensational topic, so it's quite a new topic, and they don't really uh, take into consideration the human rights factor when reporting cases. So I would say uh, awareness raising comes first so that society change their hearts and minds. And then uh, the laws are, I think they go together, the three of them. So laws, <laughs> awareness raising and implementation. And I see Krushala has joined, I think, just. Krushala, are you back on? <laughs> Are you back on, Krushala? I see your microphone is not um, turned on. Yes. Hello, yes, Krushala. Oh, yeah. oh, fantastic, Krushala. Let me get right in the heart of the matter. Um, you are um, in charge of leading drama classes in Nepal to address the issue of forced marriages. Now, we would love to hear how are these classes organized? How, um, um, you know, can the girls and women involved take part? What kind of content, content do you use to address that? We would love to hear your insights as to, you know, the way you address this uh, very harrowing issue through uh, drama and uh, in, in your local community. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Navila, uh, and namaste everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be participating in this event and I thank the IPD for inviting me to share my story here. Uh, my political journey so far of being a people's representative of rural municipality in the Eastern Hills of Nepal. Uh, when I was 16 years old, I learned sports and Mara, a modern Japanese martial art which took me to Japan and other countries for competition. Uh, there I saw many young Nepalese men and women uh, laboring in mostly manual work uh, to support their families back home. Uh, lack of employment opportunities had uh, driven them to such difficult and dangerous and uh, low paying jobs. Uh, such a problem of livelihood uh, for youth and other social issues uh, lead me to wonder if I should join politics. Uh, therefore, when in 2017, a local district branch of a national uh, party asked me if I was interested to uh, stand for election uh, for my local municipality, I said yes very quickly. Uh, due to the support of my family, uh, the initial journey was not uh, that complicated. However, once I was elected as a uh, vice chair, I felt discrimination from uh, senior political people. Uh, this happened perhaps because I saw a woman and too young to be a politician in our context. And because I had my own views and ideas about issues like a sustainable, sustainable development. And in uh, that culture, of respecting only seniors, male politicians' views, my voice tended to be ignored. Uh, that attitude did not de deter me. Uh, I persisted to speak up and put forward my ideas. I believe that if we decide not to stop speaking and learning and growing, we will learn to survive and drive in a male-dominated society. I become more determined than before to bring positive changes in my society. Determine than before to bring positive changes in my society, including in my role as the head of the local judicial committee. Uh, I, I and my team have handled many cases of domestic violence successfully. During the last few years of experience as an elected representative of my community, I have learned a lot about its needs and priorities. Uh, for instance, the low level of women's literacy has badly impacted on their 
access to opportunities for better health and livelihood. Uh, very related to that situation are numerous economic and social issues. For example, one reason child marriage happens in our district, like in many other rural areas of Nepal, in the lack of education for girls. It is easy for the parents to marry off their girls forcibly when these youngsters have remained unschooled, despite the fact that Nepal's law bans marriage of girls and boys below 20. There was no other way to deal with this challenge than to keep raising awareness about this practice and in innovative ways through child club and, or dramas. And by stressing on educating girls and women, which is most important to give them chance for a better life and protect them from such a viola violations of their girls, their rights. It is education that allowed me to dream big. My mother was a farmer and dad worked in a small construction company. I had to work three hours every single day just to get my basic education because the nearest school was that far. But many other girls in my village did not get that opportunity to study as I did and were therefore denied of life's opportunity. That thought has helped me push ahead in my leadership journey to be in a position to encourage more girls to, to go to school and then to go to further for higher education and be gainfully employed and help them reach their full potential. I will keep it, keep doing it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Krishana, for such a powerful a presentation and for not only highlighting these issues, but actually doing something about, uh, about them. Um, it, let me um, uh, carry on the discussion with our um, people online, putting uh, com uh, questions uh, to uh, our speakers. Um, there's a question for Tamara in particular from Evelyn. Um, she's asking, what kind of discrimination as a woman have you encountered that you didn't face before you transitioned? Uh, discrimination like... Um, uh, uh, question for Tamara, uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, very briefly, I guess that every kind of discrimination that is very, uh, very present, uh, such as if you are in a group uh, uh, board of directors, for instance, uh, you are supposed, uh, you're not supposed to lead, you're not supposed to express your, um, uh, your um, uh, position, but to, to accompany uh, the position of men. Uh, the same into in, in politics and political parties. Uh, women are in general uh, confined to to perform uh, within the uh, traditional roles of women. I mean, family, uh, children, uh, but not in in those other matters that affect uh, everyone uh, that are uh, restricted to men. I mean, there are so many, so many, so many forms of discrimination that are subtle sometimes are very present in others. Mm. Um, let me um, put a question to uh, Iman. Um, uh, and, you know, you mentioned your, your activism on the ground and the fact that it happened during a, a, a global pandemic uh, as well. Um, I, I mentioned myself in introducing this discussion that violence often comes from the authorities um, when it comes to uh, protests. Um, do you fear that the British government will seek to retain uh, lockdown limits on protests uh, by giving more power to the police, for example, and reducing the right uh, to protest? Is that one of your concerns? To be honest with you, I think that they, I think the government has found more creative ways to actually shut us down. So um, I think on the surface, it looks as if the, if the government stops us from protesting, then we're actually 
you know, stopping us from actually hitting our objectives. But in actual fact, I think the protesting is is the smallest part of it all. I think it's probably the path of least resistance, just gathering thousands of people and getting them to walk on the road and march and chant something is probably the easiest part of the journey. I think the government has found more creative ways to stop us in our tracks, hence why they have given out mandates to schools and different organizations to talking about making sure that they don't reference anything BLM related in terms of ideologies and policies and um, ways to combat racism. That is a way in which the government has tried to kind of stop us in our tracks. So just to reiterate, the government has actually given schools around the UK mandates to ensure that they do not talk about anything Black Lives Matter related. So anything else is fine, but any kind of ideologies or feelings or thoughts or opinions that lie within the Black Lives Matter movement is not acceptable. That is what the government has tried to do. They've tried to stop us at our tracks, which is the usual it's not no, it's not new it's it's very much the same and it's been the same for decades so yeah it doesn't surprise me there are a few questions here on the uh, q a uh, functionality about the role of the media uh, in either supporting or indeed um becoming a hindrance uh, to uh, movements uh, like the ones you uh, you are the forefront at uh, and um, you mentioned, Iman, that you enjoyed quite a bit of support from uh, the media and great reporting. Um, generally speaking, people uh, writing about you and embracing your, your activism. But uh, it might be a different experience in countries uh, such as Venezuela or indeed Albania. And therefore, I would like to hear from both Tamara, Sidita, and indeed um, Krishala about whether they enjoy support from the media, they are encouraged in their uh, endeavors, or indeed written about in a way that becomes frankly an obstacle to uh, their um, um, campaigning. Uh, Tamara, could you start off maybe? Yeah, very briefly again. Uh, in Venezuela, we don't have free media in this moment, very few. I mean, I'm talking about uh, newspapers, radio, and TV. Uh, there are few radios, uh, very few, but no TV and, and no newspapers, printed newspapers. So we rely mostly in journalists that are working uh, online, and uh, we, uh, we get a very good support in general for spreading uh, some of the of the um, um, of the pro problems, other or not. For instance, uh, I have noticed that uh, when it comes to talk uh, of abortion, uh, they uh, they are quite cold in reproducing the news or the activities in favor of abortion. I guess that's uh, my answer. Sidita, what's your experience? Um. In Albania, let's say that um, the organization that uh, I lead is formed just because there was no voice for um, underrepresented groups in, in our media. So our media is mostly uh, politicized. And uh, when they try to report something is more in a gossip or sensational kind of uh, way. So this is why there was this huge um, space for us to come alive and to, to, to be the voice of everyone who could not be heard and who is not even uh, mentioned in uh, the, the general, uh, the typical traditional media. So um, when, um, let's say that LGBTI issues and women issues would would create a news uh, uh, an audience would would create uh, some kind of impact in terms of curiosity, but not in terms of um, um, quality media reporting and uh, to to help a movement. I don't think we are there yet. Um, there is a lot to be done, and uh, we are just starting now. To, to work together with other movements to, to train this uh, journalist on uh, better uh, ethical media reporting. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Krishala, your experience must be also uh, quite different in Nepal. Uh, they are, I'm receiving uh, questions here from Manju, from uh, Devin, um, highlighting the difficulty of being a woman in Nepal, full stop, but even more so of being a woman in a rural part of, of Nepal. How difficult was it for you to get into politics as a woman? Uh, thank you so much for your question. Uh, as a woman, we have uh, uh, so many problems and we faced so many problems. Uh, like uh, uh, she is a woman, she can't decide everything and she, um, uh, she, uh, she doesn't have uh, uh, she doesn't have their own views, uh, so they feel as a uh, senior politician uh, and male politician, they feel uh, uh, she, is, she is a uh, woman and she is a, um, uh, uh, young, so she, she, don't, she doesn't have their own views, so uh, this is, it's okay, uh, we will do later, they, they talk about and they told uh, us always like that, so I feel that time I, I am uh, uh, in a discrimination, so um, uh, that time and they just uh, uh, bring lightly our opinions and our views. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have uh, lots of questions from people asking what kind, and, and I guess it's a question to you all really, what kind of message of hope um, would you uh, give to young people, to people from LGBTI communities, uh, to black people, uh, to uh, women in, uh, you know, in, in the disadvantaged uh, um, societies, um, what kind of message of hope would you give these people and what keeps you going, frankly? Can I start with you, Iman? Yes. Um, so the first thing that I would say is stop asking for someone else to make a difference. Stop asking for when someone else is going to help make things better. You'll be waiting a very long time if you keep asking that same question. So the real question you should be asking is, what is it that I can do to make things better? What is it that I can do to infect and, and ensure change? And I think that is a hard transition, but once you make that transition, magic can happen, basically. Um, so that is what I would say, stop kind of putting your aims and your wishes and your dreams and your hopes for equality out on someone else. If you believe something, you have the power to do something about it. That is what I believe hands down. So that is what my message is. Stop looking outwards, look inwards. Would you agree with that uh, kind of message, Tamara? Is that what you believe in? Is that what starts? Certainly. Mm -hmm. Certainly, man, you, you say that beautifully. I guess that, that this is the, the key of everything and every action. I will just add another thing. When you uh, feel that um, power in your hands, uh, please do create network, uh, networking and awareness because uh, we are not alone. We have to act together and create these networks in order to achieve the change. Mm. Sidita, I'm sure you would agree with that. You yeah. believe in the um, power of communities. Can you tell us more about, about that? Yeah, I was uh, trying to think of uh, things to say and uh, so many things. Uh, first, uh, it starts with the hard truth. It's very hard and it's going to be hard. But, uh, you know, like we all try to make sense of life and we have like three or four like things that keeps us going. I think also when it comes to um, having different problematic is the same like theory, like just to find like the meaning in life, like what makes you happy and everything and do it as Imam was saying, but still um, the best thing that I learned is that you are not alone and that's what uh, can get you through anything. So there is always people that are there to work with you, to believe in the same things that you do believe and to make the change. Because 
it's really hard sometimes and it is slow. That is what it's kind of uh, nerve wracking sometimes, but it, it does change slowly with the right people, with uh, some kind of really deep belief, things do change. So just find these like support things that you need in your life to keep you going and keep you positive to never uh, sort of uh, give up. And then you will find the right way and the right people that will help you through it. And if I may, uh, Sidita, because you've had experience working in the United uh, in the United States in Washington D.C. as well as part yeah. of an NGO, is that part is that kind of experience the kind of support network that you can later use to bring about change and learn from how people do things or address issues and challenges in different parts of the world, and then bring it home and try to implement it. Exactly. So, um, like when you start, you are young and alone and afraid, and you have so many problematics. But then, uh, yeah, this was one experience like going for uh, as an intern with uh, Human Rights Campaign, but also I've been like to Netherlands with the Helsinki Committee. So, somehow, I never envisioned myself going through all these things in these 10 years of uh, work. And it was never a work when I started. It was just a desire to, to change things that I didn't like. Not that I didn't like, but that were not fair. So, then the possi possibilities come along uh, uh, as uh, magically, I would say. Um, exchanging experiences, as you said, is one of the the main thing that you can uh, sort of then start to picture and envision change. So you see things done somewhere and then you see how it could be uh, in your own country. So like, of course it does because changing, uh, like meeting uh, people and seeing different uh, context only broadens your mind and just opens you up to more, uh, mm, more more changes more mm. i don't know yeah 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 absolutely but i like the the short answer is yes <laughs> krishal i also want a short answer from you um as a woman campaigning uh in a rural community in nepal did you feel that you were isolated in your activism or did you actually feel the support from people around you, starting with family, friends, and indeed your local community, and perhaps even enjoy some financial support uh, from uh, people who um, believe uh, in your cause and what you're doing. Uh, yeah, uh, sometimes I feel isolated uh, from uh, uh, many people, like a politician and other um, who doesn't uh, support me but uh, I feel uh, very lucky and I feel uh, uh, glad to some people who helped me uh, properly and my family also helped me uh, to do something different and to do something uh, different work to for, uh, for society so uh, many people helped me uh, different way like a uh, financially and uh, some uh, physically and some uh, emotionally, they support me. That times I feel uh, very happy and I have, uh, and internally I feel I have to do something for our society. And that time uh, mm, we have to change our society and we have to change our country. And then uh, we have to uh, start from ourselves. The, that time, uh, every uh, people, every people have to uh, as a uh, strong, as a strong woman, as a strong uh, girls, we have to represent our society. Then they help us to uh, change our society. Uh, so uh, I hope that in the future, all the young women and men uh, feel equal responsible to responsible to uh, develop one society country and the world thank you very much indeed uh, krishana uh, iman in a couple of minutes if you can um, there's a question for you about what's the difference between the black lives matter movement and your own reformist movement yes so there is a huge difference 
So just to give a bit more context, um, within the UK, the Black Lives Matter movement comprises of more or less three different ideologies. So I like to put it as three different aspects, three different parties, if you will. So you have the right aspect of the movement, of the BLM movement, which believes in the abolition of police. It believes in smashing capitalism, or getting rid of capitalism. In other words, becoming a communist country and also believes in removing all prisons. So there's no such thing as a prison. That is ultimately the, the golden thread that runs throughout the Black Lives Matter movement from the US to the UK. So as much as those ideologies, the abolition of police or defunding the police, getting rid of prisons and smashing capitalism, as much as they may be fitting for the US, we have an entirely different set of circumstances in the UK. So for example, me in the US, in terms of their racism, it is more overt. So again, just to break it down for you a little bit more, racism has three types, three main types. People don't actually realize that. People will just think of one type of racism. There's actually three, three main types. Overt, which is the obvious form of discriminatory behavior, obvious types of bigotry, such as the killing and murder of George Floyd, that's overt racism. We have covert racism, which is more like every day, which are statements that you don't actually realize are extremely offensive and extremely prejudiced, but they are. Um, different comments, whether it is, can I touch your hair? Is your hair real? I went to Turkey the other day and you're, I'm, I'm almost your color. Oh, you're really smart and really articulate and really well-spoken for a black woman. Oh, you're quite pretty for a black girl, aren't you? Those types of comments, covert racism. And then we have institutionalized racism. Whereas all of those types of bigotry and all of those types of prejudices and biases are wrapped up within an organization. So the people within an organization secretly feel as if black people are criminals and black people aren't articulate and black people should be in prison because they sell drugs for a living. That happens within an organization and that is called institutionalized racism. It's actually the same as institutionalized sexism, which most people are actually aware of. So the point that I'm trying to make after my long everlasting speech is that it's been very difficult trying to explain the difference, highlight the difference, um, but most importantly, trying to get people to realize that we are stuck in a vicious cycle. Um, and if we continue to just talk about the police as institutionalized racism, if we just talk about overt racism, then we are never going to make progress in society. So therefore we need to stop just talking about the police. We need to stop just talking about people saying the N word. And now we need to go a bit deeper. And that is why I built the Black Reformers Movement. So to sum it up, two clear distinctions. Black Lives Matter UK, Black Lives Matter US, believe in the abolition of police, believe in communism, and believe in getting rid of prisons. The Black Reformist Movement believes in Building awareness with all forms of racism, overt, covert, institutionalized. It believes in black empowerment, ensuring that we have the self-esteem to build ourselves up as a black community. And it also believes in institutionalized racism, where organizations find different ways, secret, hidden ways, to stop black people from thriving and being the best versions of themselves. That is what I believe in, and that is why I built the Black Women's Movement. Two very clear distinctions. And what I will say is we both believe in the same thing. We both have the same objective, which is black equality. So it doesn't matter if we have different ideologies, we want the same thing. And that's what it comes down to. Absolutely. And we certainly, all of us are here and many of us in societies around the world are uh, striving to see equality for all, regardless of uh, your background. And I have to say, uh, to wrap things up, that the, it was a remarkably interesting discussion. And I don't think that there's any doubt that, that we have 
all been inspired by what was said. And I predicted tales of incredible achievement, and that's exactly what we got. And beyond anything we've learned, and there's been plenty, both in terms of facts and arguments, I think the best thing about this event is that we've all been captivated by extraordinary lives. Um, I certainly feel far more ready to press on with project than I was at the beginning of this uh, discussion. And I very much hope that you feel the same way too. And once again, I would like to say a very big thank you to all our wonderful speakers and indeed to you all, our wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. <laughs>